and I'll start the Hi, right, the recording's started now. My name is Mark Morales and I'll start the presentation here, introduce myself and Eric, and then we'll get on with showing you some slides and then a demonstration and discussion about application security. So I'm a partner solutions architect at Snake and I'm presently living in the Philadelphia area. I'm originally from Chicago and I spent many years writing software, including embedded code for, for automobiles. Um, last 10, 15 years, I've been doing the DevOps. Really excited to be here today because I feel that my experience doing um, a lot of, say, DevOps pipelines and working in security is going to show in some of the enthusiasm I have for the presentation. Um, I'd like next to introduce um, Eric, and I'll have him introduce himself and describe what he has. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric. I am a software developer for the last, gosh, 30 years or so. Um, based in North Texas, I have been a Docker user since gosh, back in dot six version days or early, early days before we had any orchestrators or anything. Um, I've been around quite a bit in the CI world. I used to be a Jenkins ambassador, I'm currently a Docker captain and just uh, got my CKS certification. So I got all three. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to be here. I I've, uh, um, am involved in the dev relations department at Sneak uh, in the cloud native and containers area, which is you know, what we're going to talk a lot about today. Okay. So we'll have an agenda, we'll go through some slides and then do some demonstration and then wrap it up with whatever kind of Q&A we have. Um, at this point, Eric, I'll let you start describing a little bit of how we get started here. Sure. So first, um, I wanna talk a little bit about DevOps and security and how it plays together. DevOps to a lot of us, um, you know, the first thing you hear, you might think it's a, it's a buzzword, right? Um, but really it's not, it, it, it is, I mean, to use the canned thing, it's a culture, right? It is development and operations and everything in between working together to get our software in front of our customers. And um, that's overly simplified, but you know, when we think about DevOps, we often think about pipelines and getting the, you know, the software delivery lifecycle, getting our code from, you know, ideation really all the way to production in front of our customers. And when this is a simplified view of a, of a, a pipeline, obviously, the ones you see at your organizations are probably more complex, have more stages to them and whatnot, but they're generally fall into this kind of a thing. Now I've added our little patch uh, logo, our dog to a couple of areas in the pipeline that we've historically seen security applied. Uh, table stakes is production. We've always had security in production, right? You've got, since the dawn of time, we've had firewalls, we've had access control, tripwire alerting, in, in, uh, intrusion detection, you name it. All those things have always been baked into our production systems and our sysops and security teams have done a great job you know, making sure that things are hardened. And we do our best to not, uh, to, to anticipate you know, the, at the perimeter what people could do. Um, as CD started to become a term, as uh, you know, uh, we, we saw security start to get applied in those pipelines, as we started to call them pipelines, honestly, um, usually though at a late stage, far to the right, if you will. And that was often because the tools were either not, either it wasn't automated, it was just a manual gating stage where your security teams would do audits of the application de deliverables and make sure everything looked good. Um, or they might've been automated tools, but the, the historically those tools are, are really slow to be, to be fair. I mean, they, they can take overnight sometimes to run if you have a big enough application or a complicated enough one. Uh, they also might have very complex licensing uh, schemes to where only a couple of your CI agents can run them or they only they could only run in a certain environment in the, in the uh, enterprise. Um, things like that caused these stages to be far to the right, usually after functional testing was done, after performance and load testing and things like that happened. And if, heaven forbid, something came up, They'd pull the cord, stop the line, and you'd all have to huddle around and figure out what did we do? How did we add an additional vulnerability or whatever the audit came up with? And kind of um, just like any late stage bug find, you've got to now bisect the build, you know, figure out what it is you did that, and, and, and what do we need to do to remediate this to make sure we go out still on time? Or do we need to just put it on the backlog and fix it later, which is never a good solution because now you're going with known vulnerabilities, for, for instance. So as things matured, we moved um, security farther left down the pipeline and we added things to the repositories and registries, especially around containers, which is what I'm, you know, the, the kind of my, my area of expertise right now. And the registries were the first place you really saw this. This is where you, when you pushed your image into a registry, it would do a scan for you and come up back basically with a spreadsheet, a table 
of CVEs. Hey, you've got these problems, have fun. Um, that's good. I mean, it's better than not having it. And it is at least earlier in the stage. So, you know, as soon as you produced an image that can be deployed, that it has XYZ vulnerability. Um, and also we saw this in the repository, the, you know, the, the continuous delivery or the, the pipeline part of the, the repository, as the image was being built, you could actually do it right there if you had a tool that could be um, called from your stage. So you could say, hey, build the image. And right before I push it, I want you to look at this system. And hopefully it's fast enough to come back with a, 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 you know, a decent amount of time, give you the same kind of information. Even better, we move towards our branches and pull requests. So uh, every time, if you're on a Git type of workflow, often you have a pull request and you will uh, have automated reviews of some kind, whether they be smoke tests or um, uh, code style tech checking, you know, all sorts of things like that. Well, this kind of a security product, if it's if it's performant enough, could be applied at that point too. So you aren't allowed to merge to main or whatever your development uh, branching strategy is until you've resolved the, these problems. And you can apply the same kind of ratcheting techniques you do to any other tests to say, if vulnerabilities go up or if severity is increased or whatever, you could restrict that. And that's that's pretty mature if, you, if you've gotten to that point. But the holy grail of this is to get this kind of analysis and scanning all the way into the day-to-day the -day workflow of the developer on their workstation. So all the way on that left box here, the coding, as a developer, I'm coding things up. I'm often building my application. And usually if you're in a containerized world, you're, you're putting it into a container and running it locally so that you're running it in some semblance of what you'll be doing in production. Well, why not just scan the image right there? If you've got tools that are fast enough to do that and tools that are give you proactive information that can help you solve any issues that they come up with by giving you advice on, hey, this is broken in this version, it's fixed in this one, so you just added this. <laughs> you are now in control. It's, it's right at the top of your mind. I know what I added, and I know I just added this extra vulnerability. I can either take care of it right now, or I can pull my lead over to my desk or onto Zoom, you know, whatever we're doing at the time. And um, if I need security's involvement, I can pull them in now proactively and say, hey, I'm seeing this, and we need some help understanding the priority of this and, and, and the impact of this, and, and just handle it right then and there. And this is all part of CI fast feedback. So this is where you hear the term DevSecOps. And yeah, there we go. So this isn't really a thing. DevSecOps, it, it's a term people use to make to basically remind you that security needs to be part of your DevOps patterns and world. Um, just like QA, just like uh, deployment, just like everything else that we bundle under that DevOps umbrella, security needs to be part of the game. We need to invite them to our party, right? Go ahead, next one. So specifically, what are these challenges we face as developers writing containers nowadays? The first one uh, is the increased scope of responsibility that we're facing. So as, as a developer, as containers started to come into my life, um, I understood things like operating system packages existed. I knew that you know file system permissions and user ID restrictions and things, I knew about all those things from a point of view of a consumer of the advice that my sysops security network teams, everyone else gave me, and I, I, I fit into their rules. But now all of those things are, are in my purview because I'm writing my Docker file or my Kubernetes YAML or whatever else that those aspects now are controlled by. It's infrastructure as code or infrastructure as configuration, as some people like to say. And it's, it's up to me now. And while I have those teams available to me to help me, the, the code is right there in with my application code often. And if I make a change that breaks it, I need to know. And historically, we have a lack of expertise around that. I'm not a AppSec expert necessarily as a developer on, on a big enterprise application. I'm not a network expert. I don't know how firewalls work and, and configuring Kubernetes network policy might be you know, above, you know, something I'm not familiar with. So we're having to learn these things. And on top of all of this, the whole point is velocity, right? We're the agile DevOps, CI, CD is all about getting things from ideation to production as fast and as uh, high quality as possible. Anything we introduce to you as a developer that is going to slow that velocity down is business is not going to like. In fact, they probably want you to increase that velocity. Uh, so we want to make sure that anything you're you're looking at. Um, 
uh, you know, helps, the, you know, keeps the velocity up. So let's go to the next slide. So what is it we develop? Um, so we're pretty familiar with, you know, the, the application. We have source code, for instance. Um, so we know we need to write secure source code. We have libraries we depend on, external dependencies, packages, modules, depending on what language you write things in. That's pretty obvious to us. We, we understand that we need to do that. But when it comes to containers, we now have things like the Docker file, which, as I said before, this is operating system level kind of things. In this little screenshot example, we've got Python. OK, I know what Python is, but what distribution of Linux is the file system in that container based on? What else is coming in with that base image? What are the packages I'm adding? What are the, what are the you know, versions in those? All of those kind of questions start piling up. And they're things that we didn't necessarily throw over the fence before because we, we, we knew, hey, I know I need stress ng for whatever reason, my application. But the management and maintenance of that was often not our problem, if you will. Uh, infrastructure as code is another aspect. So you might have Terraform or CloudFormation or other things uh, right alongside your code that you know handle the wiring together of all the infrastructure under your app. That adds some complexity. And the granddaddy of them all, of course, Kubernetes in the container space, is this massive API that changes three times a year now. Um, and it's it's just it's it's complicated to to be honest. And it's enough to get our apps running in this that we might hyperventilate. Um, but keeping it hardened on top of all that can drive, drive us crazy sometimes. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Marco. So I'm going to hand over to Marco right now to talk a little bit about some of the ways we can mitigate both container as well as other, you know, other aspects of our security in our apps. Yeah, thank you, Eric. So I'll start transitioning here to the, the demonstration. I want to give you a little bit of context, right? So I have a, some bullet points item. We are going to be looking at a repository, the vulnerabilities, some fixes and things along the way. Eric and I have enjoyed developing this story because we're using a newer repository. It's a, it's a, it's a Java application. It's named after our popular line of vulnerable applications called Goof. So it's Java Goof. We will provide links to the repository and our documentation and other things for the folks during this session as a cut and paste. And it's also going to be shown on screen. But I'll go and take you through a journey now where we're going to use a couple of different tools. And as Eric and I were developing this, we said, well, what do we want to show? Let's show a little bit of everything, right? A little bit of everything here is, yes, we're going to have a Java application. It's going to be in Maven. It's going to be hosted on Atlassian Bitbucket Cloud. We're going to have a little bit of Docker, some pipelines. We're going to be deploying to AWS ECR. Um, and in the end, we'll have an EKS cluster. There's probably some other stuff that I may have missed. But the idea here was to kind of do this in your language, the audience, um, in ways to say, like, I've seen those things. I've done those things. If you happen to use something else like AKS, I hope you'll see that some of the patterns we have here aren't really specific to a technology. It's just that the language or the parameters are, are along those things. And I'll try to explain those along the way. So from this point, I'll stop this part of the presentation. Eric will pick it up later. And I'll move into the demo mode to show you some of the things that, that I've been describing. And as always, um, you know, because we've enjoyed developing this um, uh, demonstration, if you have questions, pop them into the slide. Eric and I will try to read to the best of our ability. And if we need to answer right away, we'll do, we'll do our best and, and do that. So what I actually had in the first uh, tab is this is going to be the original source of truth for the repository. It is on GitHub. We will give you a link and it's Java goof and we have some nice documentation. What I did is to work with an Atlassian Bitbucket to kind of give it like a different feel. So you and your team will have a set of repositories and I imported this directly from GitHub and have it in here. Has all the stuff, Many of you may have access to your own Bitbucket, and I encourage you because we will be putting out a workshop that has all the steps already there. We're almost there. We may be ready as early as this Friday. But here we are as a developer. Um, I may look at the web page. On the, on the one side, Eric did mention about the ID. I use Visual Studio Code. It's my preference. Um, I do have the, uh, the sneak integration. That's, that's something I do. And I can see some of those details from the ID, but we're not going to cover today. I also horse around with the CLI. Um, we know that some people like typing in commands and seeing the results in JSON format. That's actually something that we do and support, but we're not going to dive into that too much because we feel the visualness of the demo and explanation is. But I do want you to know that's available to you if you want to just kind of do your own JQ and, and whatever else you want to do to process the results. So I have my repository. I can scan and I can look at it and I can feel like I am contributing on a team. One of the things I did 
is I onboarded the sneak integration in a separate time. I've actually put out a couple of videos that show how you do this in a couple of minutes to just plumb in sneak and then you get this nice little word that says sneak on the side, which used to be the word security. Clicking into it is going to, is going to be how we start our journey. So I'll click into here and I'm going to see a summary page of the vulnerabilities for my application. So here's a couple of things. One is I mentioned we have a Java application. It is a nested Maven project. And for those Maven people out there, you'll kind of recognize what's happening. Oh, I can see I have a parent POM and I have some dependent POMs in here and we kind of speak to those. Those are what we're gonna call as projects because we look at your code from that perspective and we generate results. We also have some things like the Docker file, which we're gonna speak to next. But what we're trying to convey here is we'll look at your whole source tree and kind of try to do our best to just put details around it. And you can see, I, I can see summary lines at the top. I have a thousand vulnerabilities and I have them in different colors for um, criticality, critical high, mediums and lows, which is stuff that people like. If you pay a lot of attention, you'll notice that the top level POM at the very list, uh, bottom of the list has zeros across because it's, it's pretty clean. It's the stuff underneath. Um, we can go into each one, but we're not. I do encourage you at some point, if you want to try it, check it out and see the results and we will give you instructions. I'm going to focus right now on the Docker file to give you like an example of some of the things you'll see and what you should expect as you do your DevOps and you do your security with the solution. So clicking into this, I'm going to bring this inline presentation page that shows all the vulnerabilities for the Docker file. Eric has mentioned things that, you know, we have code and, and infrastructure and, and other things. This is along the Docker file side. And the, the readout I want to give you here is, you know, what we're working hard with, you know, as, as part of the, the, the efforts we do to make things better for the community, is we're trying to give the development teams the right information so they can make decisions more quickly. Um, I've used a bunch of different tools as you have. And, you know, sometimes the docs are good and sometimes they're not and so on. What we're trying to do is say, well, let's put ourselves in the mindset of, of a developer. And what are they going to know? They're going to want a nice summary. So we're trying to do it at the top, right? You see the, you see the duplication of that summary line with 66 critical and the other numbers. One of the things we do right off the start is we order all these vulnerabilities by this score. And as you click into the different um, information icons for the different ones, you'll see things that contribute to why this score is 714. Sometimes they get really high in the 900s and sometimes they're very low. For this one here, what we're telling folks is this has a high score because it's critical um, and there's a fix that's out there. We have a great talk track that we do externally and even internally where sometimes there is a vulnerability, but there is no fix yet available. Um, other things that you may see as we dig into other ones is that some vulnerabilities have known exploits and we'll list that out there, or the exploit is only available as a proof of concept or there is no known exploit. And that changes the scores. Again, what we're trying to do is give you enough information so that as a person, you can look top down and say, you know what, I'm gonna focus on this top level one first ahead of the one that might be at the very, very bottom because the scores aren't as interesting. So if I look at this other one, um, as a person who's new to security and may not be an expert, what I want to know is, well, what information am I getting? You know, we give you, of course, the title and, and things like in a, in a ticket kind of way. But we also give you links and I'll click into them. I may not navigate into them, but these are links to external databases that back up the way this, this vulnerability is described. Um, we have our own database, but they're all publicly available. And we have other ones that we use. And what we've learned is that folks that are highly motivated to kind of really understand and say, I, I just wanna know, um, what does it look like to get this detail? Um, and how do I understand what I'm being given so I believe it? You know, what is that information? And so we have those things available for, for the, especially the first time users to gain confidence that what they see actually means something. And you'll see that as a common pattern that, you know, different vendors and tools, us at Lassie and, and, and so on, they try to refer to third parties or sources that say, you know, don't just take our word for it, take the industry's word to say that I am making the right decision. So now you have some backing. And after a while, we hope, regardless of how you use security, that you build up enough confidence to say, I can start trusting the different vendors, including Sneak, um, that they're telling us the right thing. Um, and when you do that, then you can start working on the real part because someone's gonna say, look, I get it, I believe you. What do I need to do? And this line that I'm going to highlight here 
it's kind of like a signal to the developers who are now just dying to make a change in code. When they see this guidance, you know, you have this vulnerable version is 118.5, and we know it's fixed in this newer version. People may automatically say like, I know what to do. I know how to change the doc file. I know where to modify that line. Let me do that right now. And that's totally okay. That is your prerogative. I'm gonna show you in a little bit later how we make that a little easier, but we're trying our best to convey the right information so that your teams can do the right thing. Um, there are other ones that we can dive into, but I want to switch from here and click on the visit sneak link to show you just a little bit more detail because this is something that people will do if they want to dive even deeper. The first one, of course, is a nice presentation. I get this synopsis and I can start talking and socializing with my team. This next part is something that people will start to really dig into and try to figure out, well, what do I need to do next? So we're back on the, you know, there's other screens I can show you where I can have reports, but I want to stick with this Docker file story for now. So what we have here is we have a readout of, of, this, of this file, and you can see a lot of the same details. As you would expect, in any contemporary DevOps tool, there are ways of filtering and searching and ordering and sorting, and that's for your user convenience. We find that's really helpful for those folks who may have to do some kind of triage work as part of a group, right? This is this is like table stakes for everything, but I do want to point out a couple of things. You know, the, the lists are once again provided here, and you can see a lot of the same details with the links and so on. But there's a couple of things that I do want to draw attention. What we've learned, and we're working all the time to make it even better, is that during the triage process, sometimes folks will say something, well, you know what, I'm in an Elastian shop, and I value this vulnerability really a lot. Um, I'd like to create a Jira uh, issue. Um, I, I, we, we do offer this ignore for those cases where someone says it's not a vulnerability, but rather than say that, let's you know see what happens when I click on the create a Jira issue. As for those folks who have done this before in other tooling and environments, you know the outcome, right? You know that the idea is that we're just going to fill in some of the last minute details. In this case, I'm going to assign it to me. This is my test project. But in your world, the access will give you the right project and you can do this. And you'll see all the details as you expect um, are, are going to be auto-populated. And the reason you do this in any tool uh, in the DevOps universe will, will um, have this behavior is we're trying to make it easy so that your teams aren't doing the minutia, the little things that, that are kind of annoying, and you just get to work a lot faster. If I click on this link here, um, we'll bring up the Jira ticket. You see it's a low number because I have a brand new project for, for this. But the idea is, is that as we navigate in here, get all the links, and your team, when they're driven by Jira issues and maybe grooming sessions or however you call it, that's a behavior that we would support. We're not here to tell you, but we will support you in that kind of behavior. And you can see the, the link is on the page at the bottom. Now we, we know this is real. The last part on, on this part, and there's, there's always more, and Eric, if you wanna let me know uh, if there's other stuff. Um, the last thing I wanna show you is, one of the things we've learned is, is, remember when I mentioned how the developer may look at the guidance and say, I know what to do. I know how to fix this. Um, because I know where in the file I need to change things, I wanted to show you something that we've been working on um, over time to make it even better for the folks. And here is this idea of the base image. Um, the results from this video today may change at any time because there's always a newer base image. And so I may have guidance that you're going to see, and you may already be looking at the, at the numbers on screen. Tomorrow, it may be 8572 for all we know. But the point is, we know because we're working with Docker and other folks. And that's a tool that I did not mention up front. We're working with Docker to find out what are the different images out there and what are their vulnerabilities? And can we give a nice message to the people on the other side so they can say, I have information I can use to make the best decision. So you see, we have this current image of 8521 and we're recommending 8571. We also have other ones and you'll see the vulnerability count drop from 634 to something smaller. One of the things we learned is that sometimes teams need to stick within a certain version family. I have to stay in 8.5. I can't move because my stack requires it. Or other teams are saying like, we don't have that requirement. I can now look at Tomcat 10 and so on to do the right thing. We feel that given this kind of information, folks on the other side can, can now, instead of digging into a lot of details, can almost make a much more simple, not binary, 
but near binary decision is do I do this or not, right? If they do something like click the open a fixed PR, what's gonna happen is I think what you should expect, you know, as a developer, you may be checking out files and, and doing things in the branch and so on. We learned that's like a rote operation. So I clicked on the one button, I'm going to confirm that yeah, this is what I wanna do and I'll open a fixed PR. What this does, it's gonna bring me back to Atlassian Bitbucket to show me the results of that. We populated a lot of details and what we'd like to think is that when you have your universe, your, your tooling and stuff that supports this kind of behavior, you're not so much worried about using an editor to type in numbers, which you miss me, me mistype. And I, I was talking to Eric, I don't know how many times during the creation of these demos, we forget to add the right parameter. Like, oh my goodness, I didn't write, you know, 851 or, or something. It's, it's sometimes, it's probably almost always better to have the solution figured out to you. So the punchline here is if I navigate to the bottom and draw attention, I'll even magnify it because it's a neat thing. When I draw this, you may think like, it's just a simple one line thing. I would like to ask folks just to kind of ask yourself, how many times do I have a simple fix like this and I still make that typo? Um, I know I do it quite often and we would feel like, you know, this is, this is simple. It's a one file example. But one of the things I don't show you in this, in this demo part is you can actually multi-select a number of vulnerabilities and apply all those things. So think about that. I've just selected 10. I know they're one line things. There is a little bit of strength in that and it helps out my team to do this. Um, I'll keep moving on because I'm now in Bitbucket. Is there any question, Eric? I think you've been answering questions. Is that correct? I just got one. Uh, they were asking if we have integration with GitHub as well. And yes, we do. Yes, we do. Thank you very much. All right. So now you see, right? So we're, we're in, we're cool. We're, we're working in GitLab. I see the, because I'm watching the screen now. Yes, the GitLab, right? Um, so one of the things I want to show is like, so we, we've done some vulnerabilities. We kind of some things. So we do some pull requests. I'm not going to approve this right now because I don't want to change, because I want to hop into the pipelines. So, so one of the things we thought of, like, let's, let's show a pipeline, right? You know, we, we do have GitHub Actions and other things, CircleCI and, and a lot of great tools out there. But for this thing, we're going to keep it in the family and show you a, a, a uh, Atlassian Bitbucket pipeline, which I've been running. And I think one of us, um, did I do the fix? I'm sorry, if I, if I automatically applied it, that was not intentional. Um, so the, I'll, I'll click on this one from yesterday where I deployed um, a, a fix. But the, the evidence I want to show you here is, you know, we do have this plumbing and we can work with it. And for those of you who are doing Atlassian Bitbucket Pipelines, the reference implementation that we provide to you has a build, I'm sorry, a, a pipeline YAML file available to you. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, it did run, it did deploy to Kubernetes. I'd like to show you some of the details um, because that will speak to those folks who are like acquaint, uh, who are acquainted with all those things. So it's mostly a standard Bitbucket's pipeline YAML. There's a couple of callouts out there to use common behaviors so that you and your team can more quickly identify it. So one of the first things I have, just to do a quick shout, is the first couple of things, um, the first couple of stages, they're just pure Bitbucket operations. We do a checkout, we do a Maven build, we do an Atlassian scan. That's, that's something that we feel is a good best practice. And we would encourage folks to always consider having some kind of operation like this because you know it's a sanity check. It is a diagnostic operation. Everything seems to be working. So when I'm trying the next level stuff, as Eric showed us moving to the, to the right, um, I can feel that this is really, really working and it's good hygiene. The next item, which we don't have to get into a lot of detail, but I do wanna call it, is that we do have for those Bitbucket folks, pipes. Um, we have sneak integrations as pipe. First one is that we do um, run, we allow you to inline the scan of your image. Just think about it this way. Uh, me and my development team, we're building these containers. I feel really great, um, but I want to include the automated pipeline response of a scan for its results. And we have that, right? And if I were just to draw a little bit of attention, not for detail, but just for kind of like the, the visual, if I highlight these lines and show the pipe, it's not a lot of detail, right? It's just some configuration data versions and so on. And the net result to you is that you'll get all the beauty of getting a sneak container scan within your pipeline. The other one here, for those that are acquainted, is we are, you know, I'm just using an uh, AWS ECR push, right? Um, I learned a lot, you know, in this process. And, you know, it's exciting to see 
the, the, the registry and it, and it worked. Um, because one of the things I also did is I pushed this to a Kubernetes cluster. This is the part where I now start transitioning over to Eric because he's gonna show you this thing. But I did wanna leave this thing here, right? You saw me build, you saw me scan, you saw me push the container to a registry and you see evidence here that I am pushing to a, to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and the, one of the builds actually worked in recent times. Um, at this point, I think Eric, um, if there are questions, um, you know, we can, I can start the, the movement over because I wanted to just finish off. We're, we're carried through, right? We're in pipeline mode. Let's start seeing some stuff working in a real um, running container because the application is running. Any comments? Eric, are you ready to take over? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, grab the screen in just a moment. Uh, there is one open question about if we uh, support things like Yocto. I'm not personally familiar with Yocto. I just looked at the page real quick. And um, hold that. let's hold that question until after I do my demonstration and you can see if it fits in or not. And if not, you know what, I'll look into that and I'll tweet about it uh, over the next day or two. Okay, thank you. I'll stop sharing Eric. You can take over from here and I'll start answering the questions on your behalf. Cool, let me get my screen share going. I actually have opened, somebody else had asked if we support um, a few different things and I just wanted to address those real quick. Uh, On-prem support is possible. It's not in the free tier. It is in the enterprise tier for on-prem. If you scroll down, you see all the differences. Everything I'm gonna be showing you and demonstrating today is in the free tier. Uh, I'm DevRel, I'm not in sales, I'm not, I don't have a quota. So I'm gonna show you what you can do for free today. Uh, you can sign up for a free account and do everything, anything I show you uh, without having to uh, pay for a thing. Um, if you'd like to pay us, we'd love it. <laughs> that's that's uh, uh, obviously. But the other thing uh, people were asking about integrations. So uh, if you create a free account, and this is probably available on the, on the main website, but if you go into your apps and go to um, integrations, you'll see the tab integrations, uh, all of these different integrations. GitLab was the one, uh, other one that was asked about. Yes, that is in there. We have integrations with various container registries, including the big ones like Docker Hub, ECR, GCR, so forth. Um, uh, do, 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 do. We have some container uh, in integration, the Kubernetes piece, that is part of one of our paid tiers as far as monitoring a live Kubernetes cluster. I'll talk about that a little bit, but I won't go into it. And CI and IDE, plug all sorts of stuff. So um, that's enough about that. So let's get to, let me jump back to my other screen. So let's talk about this. So uh, Marco was talking about the Tomcat version, the base image version. And um, let me set the scene. We're gonna do a little, little uh, mock play here, right? Uh, we're at a company and we are a Java company. We have a Java EE app that has been making us money forever. It's the world's best to-do list. And uh, it was something that uh, back a couple of years back, 2017 maybe, uh, a few years back, we decided to put it in containers so that we could uh, deploy it to an orchestrator like Kubernetes and uh, get to take advantage of that, that, that fabric. Uh, so at the time, we built this Docker file out. And if you're familiar with Docker files, this is, which is the, we, these are the instructions to build an image. This is a multi-stage Docker file, which means it has multiple from lines. Each from line starts a new stage. The last one of which is the image that ends up being produced by your Docker build. Um, in this case, our first stage basically is just using the official Maven image at version whatever to build up our WAR file and a couple other artifacts we need. Then the final phase, is, or stage, excuse me, is the official Tomcat image at 8.5.21. And yes, that's hella old, but this is the version we were at when we lifted and shifted. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We're just gonna, we're gonna live on this and, and this is the version we know how to support and we're gonna stay on it. And you see, we copy, copy a couple configs in and we bring over the, a few artifacts from the build we just did as evidenced by the copy from build. That's, if you're not familiar with multi-stage, that's what that means is take this path from that stage named build and bring it down in here. So at the end of this, we have an image that's based on official Tomcat and our stuff. Pretty, pretty simple. Let me jump over to my browser. Now I have alias mycorp.com to the EKS cluster and load balancer deployment that uh, Marco's pipeline has deployed. And here we see, if I just hit it at the top, we're seeing the sample uh, servlet so we can verify you know, we're on 8.5.21. If I go to to-do list, give the context, there's our awesome, to-do list app, copyright to-do list MVC. Um, we're actually not concerned about the app at this point. Yes, if you go look at our repo repository after all this, there's a ton of things you can play with in here. The struts is in here, so you can do the Equifax hack. There's all sorts of stuff. But what I'm concerned about is containers. I'm specifically concerned about the Tomcat container. So if I take off my, I work for this company hat and put on my black hat, 
um, I'm looking for things to exploit. And the, what I may be doing is I, you know, looking at this is Apache's official vulnerability fix list for Apache uh, Tomcat 8. And if you scroll through here, you see all sorts of goodies, uh, denial of service uh, vulnerabilities. Um, uh, what do we got? Uh, WebSocket denial of service, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of them in here. The, the one that's interesting to me right now is the remote code execution vulnerabilities, which means the ability to run remote arbitrary code on somebody else's server. And if I scroll far enough down here, you'll see here's one that was fixed in 8523. Uh, Details about it. This means that anybody running on a version of Tomcat in the 8.5 family older than this could be vulnerable. Now, if I click on the CVE, I've already got it open here. This is our sneak vulnerability database. Again, this is just like the MITRE database, but just we've added some extra niceties to it and, and interesting information. Um, I could dig into this and I could look um, at what exactly is the problem. And I can start researching this as a, as a hacker to try to get it. But I noticed there's some exploit DB links. And one of them has a Python script. Now, I'm, I'm a middling Python program. I'm, I'm OK. But I don't even have to know what this thing does. And I can just grab this and apply it. Now, what it does is it's a proof of concept. It says, give me a, a, a web endpoint, a URL, and I'll tell you if it's vulnerable. And I'll put a POC exploit out there. Let's give it a shot. So I've got in this shell, a couple aliases. I've got one called check that is going to hit mycorp.com. Now imagine that I've got this running in some kind of like a old school war dial or looking at different endpoints on the internet that I think might be running Java app servers. And I have this one in my list. I hit this one and sure enough, it says it's vulnerable. This is just the Python script unedited. Um, I just fed it that uh, URL. And it says it put in a POC JSP. So I'm gonna jump back over to this page. And let's look at POCJSP. It injected that into this website. Now, all this is a bunch of A's. That's not very nefarious and by any means. But the fact that I could inject a JSP into a running Tomcat server that's not mine, that I have no shell access to or anything, it's not good. You can imagine what else you can do. In fact, if I run the other half, the other area that I have called Pwn, and go back to get my right keys here, I'm going to change this from POC to PWN. I get this nice little form. Let's, um, let's type something called env. These are the environment variables available to me in the contain. I don't even know what I'm in the server I'm, I'm attacking right now. And I can look at this and I can say, hmm, there's the host name of the machine I'm on, Tomcat version I'm on, um, to, 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 to do Kubernetes port. Ah, I'm likely in a container on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, service hosts, Kubernetes ports. Uh, that's my API server in Kubernetes. Now, I don't have time in the hour we have to actually hack the cluster. There are ways to get at the Kubernetes cluster if a bunch of perfect storm things happen and things are available to me. But let's see what else I can do. Uh, let's uh, check who am I. I'm root in the container. I love being root in the container because even though I'm contained, that means I can do some more things. Let's see if I can, I, I should be able to ls uh, dash ltr etsy. Sure enough, I can see everything. That's the odds of anybody can do that. But let's see if I can do this. Let's see who. I guarantee. Okay, this the, the standard out. There's no return, so I didn't return anything. But if I do that lsltr again on Etsy, you can see a foo file was just created. So I have root access to write to Etsy. I have a read write file system, most likely because I was able to write to Etsy. In fact, if I pull, let's see, root df dash h. I can see what file systems I've got. Oh, look at this. What's here? Let's see what that is. That's a directory with a token in it. Now, I'm not going to show you my token. That is my Kubernetes uh, service account token. Now, I know just because this is a demo and it's nothing super secure, that's the default namespace um, service account token. With that and a little bit of cunning, I can start talking to the API server and start finding information out. Let's do something else. What else could we do on here? Okay, nmap doesn't appear to be installed. Standard error doesn't come out of this, this uh, JSP hack. Um, but let's see, can I, get, can I get out of here? Curl, HTS, google.com. 
ah, I got a redirect, which is a good sign that I can probably get out of here and curl down things. I can bring down my own executable. I can bring down my own JVM. I can bring down hacked Java files to stick into your web app. In fact, I could probably, if I do a PWD, um, ls, uh, ls-l web apps to do list. There's your app. So I can start messing around in that. Honestly, at this point, read write file system roots. Um, I'm probably just installing a bit, uh, some kind of crypto miner and, and taking as much CPU as I can get off your box. And I'm done, you know, or I'm a bot that's doing that, you know, whatever. But you can see how, even though I'm in a container, I can do a lot of things and set up a beachhead. If I had Nmap, I can, in fact, I could, I'm going to do it right now. I can install, I can run app get and install things if I've got access to some app repo. So I could install Nmap and I can start perusing your network and see what else I could find. And I'm setting up a beachhead in your network. So not good. So let's put the brakes on that for a second. What could I do as a developer? So hopefully, you know, your intrusion detection is going off in production. This is like whoop, whoop, and what bad things, you know. But what could I do as a developer to have caught that before the reactive systems um, have to, you know, come in and set the alarm off? So let's uh, switch hats back to being the developer. And um, let's talk about a couple of things. Let me flip over here. Now, I'm going to flip to my workstation so I can quickly iterate and do some things here. But uh, if you look at my images, I've built a few things ahead of time to speed things up. Um, I've got a version of this application. I'm, let's say I'm a developer working on this application, and I'm, I'm doing this locally. And I've got a Java Goof 1 is exactly what we're running out there in, in EKS in the prior example. And if I go back over to IntelliJ, here's the Kubernetes deployment uh, that I'm going to use to deploy locally. I'm just using Docker Desktop. You could use Kind, you could use Minikube, you know, whatever. Um, but I could deploy this locally and run the same app. In fact, if I do k get all, you'll see that I am already running. I've, I've deployed it. And one of the nice things about Docker Desktop is that it will give you an automatic load balancer. So if you set a service of load balancer type up, you can then just uh, do something like this. Let me back, find my screen and change this to localhost. And so I've got the same thing running here. Um, but I want to know what's you know, let's say I've been working on this app and I've done some changes, I've, I've whatever. And I, I want to see, well, what's vulnerable in this app that I might've added or, or has been vulnerable for a while. So I do a sneak container test on Java goof at tag one. And I'm going to feed it some metadata. I'm going to set, tell it that the Docker file, one directory up from where I am, Docker file is here. So you saw what Marco showed you on the web UI. That is an active monitor of his Bitbucket repository that actually every night will rescan the manifest that it saw and let you know if any new vulnerabilities show up day after day, which is really cool because even if you don't change anything, you're going to get alerted through an email notification to say, hey, new vulnerabilities have been found in code or Docker file or whatever other things we scan um, that you should now probably take a look at because the thing you thought was secure yesterday isn't anymore. This is a command line version of, oops. <laughs> this is me uh, typing incorrectly. Uh, what did I do wrong? Sneak container test job group one. I, okay, uh, I'll have to look at that. But anyway, so it's scanning. And what it's doing now is it's pulling up the image layers and it's looking through all of them for all the packages you've installed. What is the base image we have? It's comparing the layers to the Docker file I, I told it I used. So it knows more specifics about it. So it has all the information it needs. And I'm having a network problem right now, of course. So <laughs> the SaaS system on the back end, this is the magic of, so let's scroll backwards and I'll show you what it would have shown. Um, uh, sorry, guys and girls, this is live demo, doing it live. So this is what it, I expected it to show you, um, my home networking. Hopefully I'm, you can still see and hear me okay. Uh, with something like this, which is exactly the same information you saw on the web UI, just in a command line form. And I can see all the information here, but the interesting part is usually for container scans is at the end. And I'm seeing the same recommendations uh, that uh, we saw on the web. I'm on 21, which is hella old and has lots of critical vulnerabilities. 
I should move to something newer in case, for example, 71 only has three critical vulnerabilities. At this point, I would probably pull over my lead, my pair, my, my security team and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Should we do this? And I might, you know, scratch their chin and look at it and say, well, there's no benefit really in going to nine because our app doesn't run well on anything bigger than eight five. And I'm not ready to drink the Kool-Aid and go to the uh, Amazon Coretto version of Java to get these zero vulnerabilities. So let's go ahead and just go to the latest eight five for now. And we'll do, you know, all of our, our regression testing on it, make sure it still works. And then we'll, we'll slate for later to look at newer versions of Tomcat that might get us past these vulnerabilities. You never, well, it's very rare to see zero vulnerabilities, by the way. To get to zero, you're basically saying, I'm going to handle every possible edge case that there is no fix for in the open source community for whatever libraries, you know, transit dependencies, everything else that are in here. Um, so what they've done in Coretto is they've probably just carved out everything that isn't just the very, very basics, which may work great for you, but this is a completely different JVM. So that's that's a little drastic for, for my taste. I'm not going to go through building and running that. Um, you just have to believe me that works because I want to. Uh, we're we're getting low on time. Let me jump back to my slides though. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, what you can do to protect yourself in depth against things that may not be known vulnerabilities. So there may be zero days out there. There may be um, vulnerabilities that don't have a fix that you can't get around right now. And, and, and what can you do to help mitigate that? First of all, images. When you're building your images, understand what the me what the reason why you'll, you'll always hear people talk about minimizing the footprint. And that's not just about storage and transmission time and all that stuff. It, 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 from our point of view, it's about security. You don't want to add a tool that your application doesn't need because a bad actor that gets in there can use that tool. Um, for instance, pen testers will often, you'll hear them talk about living off the land. That means using executables and content that are on the machines they're trying to exploit so as to try to avoid triggering alerts. Like they've installed, a, a new application got installed in a container or on a, on a machine. If the, if the application is already there, like curl that you just saw, I can use it, hopefully, uh, without triggering anything. It's a, it's a better case. But so don't give people a tool to beat you over the head with. Um, understand how layers work. So if you're new to containers, the images are made up of read-write read-only layers, and um, each one of those lines in a Docker file roughly equivalents is the equivalent of a layer. If you just said rm curl, you run rm curl to remove curl from your image it's gone from the containers file system at start. But if there's another exploit that allows me to somehow get access to the host's file system, let's say somebody bind mounts in var, which would be whole, horrible, but they might, I can get in there and look around under var lib docker or container d and see the C layers that are, are you know, historical in the image. So I can get at those tools that you may have thought you removed. Um, understand different build strategies. So multi-stage is a great tool, use it. You might also look at other tools. Uh, so if you're a Java shop, you might look at Jib. Jib is a great tool for building uh, containers that's 100% JVM based. You don't even need a container engine to do the build or any special tooling. You just put it right in your Maven or Gradle uh, script and it'll uh, a container will be built out of it. You can drop it to a tar, you can spit it to your registry, do whatever you want. Um, and there are other tools like that. And if you attended KubeCon, or if you've been at all involved in any of the CNCF discussions over the last 12 months, you'll know that secure supply chain is the buzzword of the year. And it's not just a buzzword. It's things that those of us who you know, worked at Docker and other places in the past have been harping on for years. We need to pay attention to where your artifacts come from. And images are artifacts. So don't deploy anything to a server, especially to production, that you don't have an audit trail for, a, a chain of custody. Um, and the new developments around SigStore and some of the other open source tools are, are looking really great to help us codify and document with a so, you know, software bill of materials where these things come from. Um, and only images that are built by your automation that is auditable should be going to any deployments. Eric Smalling's image that I built and pushed to Docker Hub, that should never get deployed anywhere important because you don't know where it came from. When it comes to runtime, this is where we can really start to mitigate things. So. I was root in a container and you saw that even though I'm contained, that means something. I can inst I can run app get, I can run all sorts of stuff that I shouldn't be able to do because I'm UID zero. There are other mitigation efforts that you can do for your host, but understand that if you volume mount, if you host, host volume mount in, like that var example I gave, I'm UID zero. I can read and write to that volume that's mounted. If it's not mounted read only, 
I could edit things on your host that way. So that's a bad day. Just don't run as root. Change your root user to something else. You might have to refactor a little bit of your deployment to make that work, but it's always a good idea. Um, by default, most uh, open source uh, official images start as root, but many of them include a user that you can switch to. So look into that. Privileged containers by default, are, that's turned off, thank goodness. Um, this gives you root access to the box. I mean, you got host device access and it's horrible. Never use privileged containers. It, for business applications, I've never seen a good reason to use them. If you're doing something like, you know, you're writing a monitor for a cluster or you're doing, um, oh gosh, um, network stack manipulation, maybe you're writing a CNI, but for most business applications, most enterprise stuff, you're not gonna need privileged container. Uh, same with Linux capabilities. Um, Linux capabilities are kernel system calls that your application might need to make a call to. For instance, um, ping needs this. It uses capabilities to be able to get at the network stack to do ICMP calls. That's a capability it needs. Your application, uh, again, business applications often don't need any of these system calls. Um, and you can just usually safely drop them all, which is an easy command line change on Docker or a manifest change in your pod spec. Um, try running with none. There's a ton of blogs out there you can look into on um, uh, determining what capabilities you need. Uh, uh, and S-Trace and Palco and things like that can help you figure that out as well. Not enough time in this call to talk about it. Uh, Read-only root file system is also another key one. If you can make your file system read-only as far as you know the, the base, what that means is when the container engine brings up all those read-only layers of the of the image get codified into one thing. It normally applies a read-write layer on the top, and all changes are handled through a copy on write operation, and everything happens at that top layer. You can tell, don't include that, and everything now it's just like you mounted your drive read-only. If your app can run that way, do it. If it can't, figure out how to make it do that because immutability is king. It's one of the twelve factors, so you should be doing it anyway. But. <laughs> um, Mount host uh, empty dirs for for work dirs or 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 do things that you know as as you can to um, uh, make sure that uh, you can get read only if you if at all possible. Pay attention to your volume mounts as well. Make sure you're not overextending those privileges and deploying from no sources. Same as the secure supply chain piece and Kubernetes specifics. Um, uh, I'm just going to leave this on the screen. Use these things. Make sure that if you're using secrets, for instance, that uh, your, your cluster ops have encrypted them at rest. It's not there by default if they're building their own clusters. Most uh, managed clusters have that automatic. Use RBAC, just do it. Uh, security context, learn about it. There'll be a link here in a second. I'll give you some info on, on all the different security contexts you can set. A lot of the things I just talked about are configurable through security context in your pods. Network policy is, is not, people get scared of it because it seems complex. It's really not. It's how do pods talk to each other? Can they or can't they? I'm a fan of setting it up with zero trust. No pods can talk to each other at all, except for what I add to the allow lists. Uh, make sure if you do that, you add DNS, because if you can't do that, you can't look up any services. And all of these things I've been discussing, you should enforce them with some kind of tool. Pod security policy is one way to do it, but that's deprecated and going away in 125. Don't quote me on that. Uh, it's being replaced by pod security admission, which is still in beta in, as of 123. Uh, there are other tools, though. OPA, with Gatekeeper for Kubernetes, is a great tool that a lot of people use to enforce these things. Kyverno is another great tool. I'm going to skip this slide because we're out of time. Um, these are links. We will share these slides. I will tweet them out myself. So if you follow Eric Smalling on Twitter, you'll see. Uh, I'll share these slides out, and Marco probably will share as well as well via uh, SlideShare or something. Um, quickly, the repository we use will be in there. Our link to our documents. I mentioned a security context document. This is a cheat sheet that will um, go over a lot of them and some of the, you know, the bullet points on how to use them right. Uh, the other one I want to call out here is if you are using pod security policy today, you want to get off of it and, and be or plan, plan to get off of it when they deprecate, read this blog about it. And if you want to know more about security context, watch some of my videos. With that, go to sneak.io, sign up for a free account, start playing with this stuff today. Marco, what do you got? in the last this is great so i did my best to answer questions um thank you eric um looking forward to you know I, if folks want to wrap this up or ask additional questions um thank you wonderful thank you both eric and marco um it was a pleasure having you here today and thank you to everyone who joined us um as a reminder this recording will be on the lennox foundation youtube page later today and we hope to see you at future webinars have a wonderful day thanks everybody